that's okay. All right, so let me get into my sermon now. I took my five minutes there. Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, if you can throw that passage up there. We've been going through the book of Revelation. We've covered chapter 1, and yet I'm going to look at a verse still in chapter 1, because I put a pause, because as we're getting ready to go into chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 focus on the seven churches that are in Asia Minor, okay, which today is modern Turkey. And Jesus has a message for each one of those churches. But before we dig into those uh, messages that God has for the church, I wanted to talk to you about a couple principles in general about the church, all right? So Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, I'll start with verse 9, says this, I, John, this is the Apostle John, the disciple John, he's known as John the Beloved in the Bible, he's the last survivor of the apostolic age, meaning he's the last apostle that's alive, the original apostle, the 12, remember? He's the last one, and he says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering Just pause. In the suffering and kingdom. So if we're going to oppose anything that is anti-biblical or anti-scripture, know this, we're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. I got good news. What? If you're not a Christian, you're going to (laughs) suffer. Pick your pie, right? In other words, in this life, Jesus said, you will have trouble. You will suffer regardless of whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or a believer or a non-believer. You're going to have suffering in this life. But John was suffering because he was a Christian. Remember, he's under Roman rule, okay? He's now been sent to the island of Patmos because he, remember what I talked about? He would not burn incense. He would not burn incense to the dictator of Rome that was above him. Domitian, he was crazy. What did he demand of all people in that time period? Get a spoonful, not of sugar, makes the me- sorry, it just came to me, makes the medicine go down. Get a spoonful of incense. I know my mind goes. Get a spoonful of incense, and you're going to burn it to me, and you're going to say Domitian is the Lord your God. And John said, no, I will not bow to a madman. Okay, the state of Washington, the state of California, the state of Oregon, There's some madmen running our nation right now. If that offends you, I'm going to say it, I don't care. I don't care. Why? Because I would rather fear God than fear man. And the church had better get back to that right thinking. That we revere God above all of what man says. So, I'll say it again. I don't care. But I care about you. Does that make sense? Because when I make the statement, I don't care about that, instantly people can say, well, you you don't care about me? Absolutely I care about you. And Jesus cares about you. But here's what the scriptures say. It's God speaking, my ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's pretty far up there, so my thoughts are above your thoughts. I say something to both my grandboys, grandsons. I got six grandkids. And I say this to them all the time. Bubba, yeah, Papa loves you. Jed, yeah, Papa loves you. You know how high I love you? No, Papa, how high? Clear up to the moon and back. Why? Because it's as high as I can see. I can't see past that. Why am I saying that? As the heavens are higher above the earth, so God's ways and his thoughts are higher above our thoughts. Man, man thinks one way, but God thinks another. And so what the church needs to do is to revere the thoughts of God, the heart of God, and the mind of God. Why? When we do that, and if we'll do that, God will restore our nation. He'll do that again. Now, are you a Democrat or Republican? I don't care. Does it matter? Yeah, it does. It does matter. Okay? But when I get into this message today, I hope your whole paradigm of thought changes. To what? To think like God. To think like Him. So, back to what it says here. I was on, I, I John, your brother and companion in the suffering for the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos. I told you why. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, I will not bow to tyranny. 
That's why John was there. What a man of God. What an awesome man. You know what we need? We need more men again. Did you hear that, man? I heard women saying amen. <laughs> I didn't hear one man say amen, but I heard the women say amen. And send one my way. How'd you do, honey? Thank you. She said she, she, said she did good. What a man. Willing to suffer for what was right, for what was true. Goes on. I was on that island on the Lord's day, and I was in the Spirit. See, when you're in the Spirit, here's what will happen. When you're in the Spirit, that means in the Holy Spirit. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Son, and these three are one. One God manifesting himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And John was saying, on this day, I was in the Spirit. So when you're in the Spirit, you think this way. If, if you're in another spirit, or if you're in the wrong spirit, forgive me, you'll think this way. See, it matters how you think. It matters what you believe. I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now, this is God speaking to him. And the voice said unto me, here it is. This, is. this is what I want to zero in on. Write down on a scroll. Okay, now remember, man, just look at all this free stuff. In the back, back there's two boxes of these. Okay, there's also pins. Why? To take notes on what I teach. Why? Because I teach a lot. I teach a lot in 50 minutes or, or an hour or two hours or 30 minutes or however long it takes. Okay, and we don't have scrolls here, but we got notebooks. Three for a dollar at Walmart. <laughs> write on a scroll, John, yeah, write down what I'm about to tell you. And then send it to the seven churches, and, and then he lists who those churches were in Asia Minor. Send it to the church in Ephesus. Send it to the church in Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So God said, John, I've got a message for all seven of those churches, and we're going to get to them next week or in the weeks to come. And I have a lot of things to say to those churches. But God has general things he wants to say that are beyond what he said to those seven churches. Now, yesterday uh, was uh, soccer day at the YMCA for ages like three to five. Okay? It's hilarious. Because the parents want them to play soccer. The kids, I'm not convinced they want to play soccer. Why? Because I was there watching them. They're twirling and spinning and jumping, <laughs> crying and angry. And it got to the point with the three-year-olds that were playing, because I, I watched my granddaughter, who was three, and then, and then my grandson, who's four, he had a different match. So I got to watch them both. All right? Well, the three-year-olds, it got to the point where the coach was chasing after the little kids saying, do you want to play? Do you want to play? Do you want to play? They didn't even have anybody to field out there anymore. Sometimes I wonder what sport's really about. What's it really about? Well, then after that, I went and watched Jed, my grandson, play. This is the four- and five-year-olds. Now, some of them want to play. And when you get to a certain age, remember, I was an ex-athlete. I shared with uh, Jason Radcliffe, who was here last week, because Jason and Scotty Radcliffe, if you don't know them, they were tremendous running backs at Kelso. Really, really, really good. And Scotty won a state title. I think it's the only one that Kelso has, all right? And I said to Jason and Scotty standing there, I do this. It's wrong of me, but I do it. I said, all right, because his mom was there. Patty was there. And I wanted to see her reaction. I said, all right, let's hear it, boys. Who was the better running back? Who's the better? And, and, and Scotty and Jason are both, you know, it, and, and they're just kind of looking at him, and, and, they're, and they're, they don't know how to answer. I says, listen, here's the thing, guys. I want you to know something about me and athletics. In my mind, I have my own narrative, my own story. And Jason's starting to smile because he knows where I'm going. He knows I'm crazy. And he's looking at me, and he's smirking. And I said to him, Jason, I want you to know something. I was the best player to ever come out of Kelso High School. 
And they both start laughing because they know I wasn't. They know I'm not. I said, and not only that, Jason, I didn't one, win one state title. I won two. I won one more than Scotty did. Now, I didn't win any, just so you know. <laughs> it's my story. It's my narrative. Now, that's funny. Now, can we take it to a spiritual level? Hmm. You know where I'm going? Do you know where I'm going? How many genders are there? Are you sure? Isn't it interesting? The slippery slope we go down. When man allows himself to create his own narrative, his own reality, and his own truth that is based in not objectivity, but that is based in subjective thinking. Again, remember pizza? We can fight over it. Really, we can fight over it. What do I mean by that? Well, some of you like Pietros that used to be Pietros. <laughs> we can fight over the name right now if we want to. Well, I think Pietros is the way it's said. Well, I think Pietros is the way it's said. And we can just go to war on that. Why? Because it's subjective. Right? Best kind of pizza, pepperoni. Wrong. That's your truth, but it ain't my truth. What's the best kind? All meat. Load it up. See? <laughs> Finally got a man to say amen in the church. Talk about food. That's funny. So you understand their subjective truth that, that can be true. Purple chairs, gray chairs. Which one's better? I don't really care. I really don't. I don't care. But I tell you what I do care about. When we're being taught to believe a lie, and when our culture begins to embrace lies as the truth, and if you disagree with that truth, you're called names that are not true. Uh, do I need to say that again? There are only two genders that exist. That's based in facts, logic, reason, reality, and science. Week three in a row, XX, XY. What's that? What's he talking about? Chromosomes. Science. There's male and there's female. Now, what just happened? I made a lot of people upset and angry right now. I don't care. I don't care, but I care about you. And I care about anybody who thinks that way and their thinking is wrong. I care about them. Well, how do you know? Because I'm standing here telling you the truth. I'm standing here telling the truth. Knowing what? Knowing people are going to call me all kinds of names. Do you think I like that? I don't. Do you think I enjoy that? I don't. Do you think John enjoyed being on the island of Patmos? He was a slave. He was imprisoned. He was sentenced to do, as a 95-year-old man, hard labor. You think he liked it? He didn't like it. But boy, was he a man. He stood for the truth, and he was persecuted for that truth. So, back to the soccer game. I haven't forgotten it. Confusion. Just write that word down, confusion. I was watching the four- and five-year-olds play, and they played, said my grandson. <laughs> he didn't want to play. But there was five of them on each team on the YMCA basketball court at one time. And if you've been to the YMCA, there's, there's two doors to get inside the gym. One door was left open. And I'm telling you, watching those four and five, it's hilarious. They moved as a herd. Wherever the ball was, the herd moved. Right? It's just two herds. There's the red team and there's the blue team. Herd red, herd blue. And they're just, they're just wherever the ball is, they're just running, Right? And generally at that age, you got one stud, right? And the one's kicking the ball, and really everybody's following him because he's following the ball, right? Do they make the goals? Not very often. But they're just herds, herd, two herds moving. Okay. All of a sudden, the door that was left open, the ball was kicked outside of the gym into the hall. Now, the hall is about, if you can see it, from the fire extinguisher to this door frame, it's about that wide out in the hall, okay? When you leave the YMCA in big groups, because there's a lot of people there, 
You're, you're leaving, okay? People coming this way, coming, and you're, and you're kind of going like this, okay? Widen the halls. They're not going to. Why? Because it's some type of a, of a building that you can't work on. What do they call that? A memorial building? Historical building. Thanks, RJ. He went to Ari Long, not Kelso. <laughs> he has better answers than me at times. <laughs> he didn't get hit in the head as many times as I did either, did you, brother? So they're kicking the ball. It goes out in the hallway. There they go, the whole herd. Red herd and blue herd. They're out in the hallway. It's one of the funniest things I ever saw. And everybody starts laughing, except I saw one person not laughing. The coach of the red team. He was so mad, which made it even funnier for me. I'm thinking, how can you be mad at a herd of, of, of four and five-year-olds that they're just doing what you told them to do? Go kick the ball. Just kick the ball. Okay, I, as, as a papa, if my grandson at this point at age four is just on the floor, I'm happy. I'm happy. Like, if he doesn't even kick, he's just out there, I'm happy. Why? He didn't want him to be out there. So this herd's moving, and for about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, the gym's empty of all the kids. I don't know what they're doing out there. I have no idea. Why am I saying that? This word confusion. Right? It, it's not hard to confuse a four-year-old. It's not hard to confuse a five-year-old. But when globally there's confusion, are you hearing me? Because I'm going from the practical to the spiritual. Why? Because we need to think that way more. Because th when things, when lies become the truth, are you hearing me? And the lies begin to be embraced by the culture overwhelmingly, right? You have to look at this, and you got to use your brain. I just offended a bunch of people again. We call it farm sense in Napa Vine. Farm sense. What's that mean? With cows? Okay. You got the bull and the girl. That's it. It's farm sense. We've lost our farm sense. <laughs> and if you lose your farm sense, right, you lose common sense. And if you lose common sense, you've lost all sense. You hearing me? Back to the spiritual. Not just nationally are these things being embraced, but lies are being embraced globally. How can that be? I'm going to say it because it's spiritual. It's spiritual. Now I'm going to use a word that the church don't talk about very much. Why? Because uh, uh, people won't come to that church. I don't care. Do I care about you? Yeah. Do I care about the people I'm speaking to? Yeah. Do I care if this church is full or empty? I, I'll be honest with you. I don't care. You really mean that? Yeah, I don't care. Can I tell you how freeing that is? Can I tell you how freeing that is? It's freeing. Why? Because it doesn't matter what you think. But it matters what you think. What matters is what God says. God brings clarity. So now I'm going to say something again, as I started to say, that people don't like and churches won't even talk about. They won't talk about. What's that? That I think we need to start thinking more spiritual. And when I say spiritual, here's what I mean. Why? Because that term within itself is messed up and confusing. When I say the church needs to think spiritual, here's what I mean. They need to think biblical. They need to think biblical. That's what I mean when I'm saying that. Are we thinking biblically? Because if we're thinking biblically, we're thinking like God. And if we're thinking like God, and we're living like God, and we're following God, knowing you can't be a God, I'm just going to throw that in for a freebie. Why? Because religion teaches that. It's wrong. Why? One God. Hero Israel, Deuteronomy 6.4. The Lord thy God is one. What God? You will never become a God, nor will I. Is that clear?
this confusion that is existing. Can we, can we throw up some of those slides? Do we have those that I picked out? Talks about the blind leading the blind, that one. I got a number of pictures right here. I'm just going to go through these. These are different ones, hopefully, than last week. Number one, the title is The Blind Leading the Blind. More than half of the church of the England pastors are now apostate. What does that mean, apostate? It means they've rejected this for their own thinking. Make sense? Okay. Next slide. Do we have one on the Bible on trial? This one will work. Pope Francis claims... I'm starting to get mad. Why? Because I hate religion. I hate it. It destroys people. Remember I told you three branches, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox. And I challenged you, and no one's come to me yet. Show me that here. Show me it here. They were first called Christians at Antioch. And then in Acts it says, I think five different times, the church was called followers of the way. Who's the way? What's the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man gets to the Father. Where's the Father at? Point, point up. He's up there. So if you want to get up there to the Father, you've got to be a follower of the way. Not the way of man, not the way of culture. Not the way of the Democratic Party, not the way of the Republican Party, the way of Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one gets to the Father who's in heaven except by me. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus did. Confusion and clarity. Three branches, Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic. Man, I make people mad, don't I? I don't mean to. I don't. I want you all to like me. But I already know you won't. I know that. Pope Francis claims. Just, just that word claims right there bothers me. The Bible says. Pope Francis claims. The Bible says. Pope Francis claims. Now, if you're Catholic, I'm not picking on you. Why? Because I would be, I would be, what's the word I want to use? Pushed into a category of Protestant if someone forced me into it. But I don't want to go there. Why? Because this way I get to pick on all branches. Well, aren't you Protestant? Oh, there's some messed up Protestant stuff going on. Don't you think for one minute, if you're Protestant, there isn't some messed up stuff going on. Pope Francis claims for the entire course of her life, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was free from any stain of sin. Confusion. Confusion. So when the highest person in the highest branch of a religious sect, S-E-C-T, claims something that goes against this, what are we to do? What are we to do? Are we to embrace this or are we to expose this? Romans, I'm going to go to the Word, chapter 3, verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, 23 says that the wages, the penalty, the price of sin is death. But God doesn't leave you hanging there. Pull that back up if you could. He doesn't leave you hanging there. The wages of sin is death, conjunction, but. Here it is. Here's the good news. The gift, the free gift of eternal life. You like that? It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
So I, I don't know anyone in this branch who's above this man. But I will say this. Some of those cardinals better get in a sanctuary with him. And they better talk to him about this. Because it goes against the word of God. Paul said it this way in Galatians chapter 1. If I. So I like what Paul does. He starts with himself. Why? Because when I say for all have sinned, I'm going to start with this guy right up here. I start with me. Why? So you don't think I'm judging you. Because I'm not judging you. Now, if you're a believer and you're a Christian, when we get into scriptures, just so you know, the scriptures teach that Christians are to judge Christians on certain things. But the message isn't on that today, so I'll go back over here. Why? Because we're being taught through Oprah's gospel, don't judge. That's her gospel. That's the cultural gospel. There are things we are to judge, and there are things we are not to judge. How do I know that? Read the book. Studied the book. Believe the book. Know the book. I like to start like Paul does, says. Galatians 1, Paul said it. If I... So I want to just say this right now. I want to be inclusive. Now that will put, put people in the chairs. I want to be inclusive now. <laughs> I'm actually having some fun this morning. I haven't even gotten to my message yet. I want to be inclusive this morning for all of sin. That's about as inclusive as it gets. Now I just watch a man who pastors the largest church in America, and I'm not here to slam and hammer people, but it may feel like it, because I don't even want to mention names. I don't like to do that. What do I do? I mention false doctrines. Paul mentioned names. I ain't Paul. I ain't Paul. That dude's way up here in my book. I told you. Who do I identify? Peter, shooting his mouth off all the time, getting in trouble all the time. I want to be inclusive for all of sin. That's me. Are you hearing me this morning? Now, don't go put me on a Pope pedestal. Don't put me on that. Why? Because I'll kick it right out from underneath myself. For all have sinned. And I heard what I believed to be the man who pastors the largest church in America say, people don't need to be told they're sinners anymore. Eh! See, that was a Protestant. See how I did that? You got a Catholic here, you got a Protestant. Men don't need to, they don't, they don't need to be told they're sinners anymore. Then he went on and said this, and you don't need to use the word repent anymore. Eh! I like do eh! I just like doing it. What's that mean? Wrong answer. Do you know what Jesus' first message was? Repent. For the kingdom of God is here. So when a Protestant, there I go, I want to clarify it, not a Catholic, when a Protestant or a Catholic or an Orthodox says to you, you don't need to repent, give him one of these. Eh! <laughs> Tell him you learned that from your pastor. Give him one of them. Why? Because they're wrong. Can you imagine undermining Jesus behind a pulpit? Ouch is the right answer, but we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing man talk about man's gospel all the time. And what do we get? Idolatry, and we get heresy, and we get a church that's powerless. And we get a culture that walks and lives in darkness when we're supposed to be the light, and we're supposed to let that light shine. We're the attraction of Jesus. That's who we're supposed to be. Confusion, back to that word. You look at this, and the only way that clarity is brought to a person, Jesus is standing before the 12, and he's praying a prayer for them in the book of John. And I believe Jesus looked to heaven. I can't prove that. 
But I believe when Jesus said this, he looked to heaven. Why? Because he was praying to his father, who is our father. And he looked to heaven. And in John 17, he said it this way, Father, sanctify them. Pause and ponder. Who is them in this passage? It's every believer in Jesus Christ. From that time period to all of you that are sitting in these purple chairs at New Horizon. Father, sanctify New Horizons by the truth. Father, your word is the truth. Isn't that beautiful? Jared prayed one of the most authentic prayers I've ever heard this morning. Something about his armpits and sweat. It's pretty awesome, Jared. Can I tell you what I thought? You want to know what I thought? Some of you go, no, I don't want to hear what goes on up there anymore. <laughs> Your poor wife. How has she done that for 30 years? <laughs> Not 40, 30. Here's what I thought, Jared, when you prayed that. That's pretty non-religious. He's praying about his armpits and odor and Jesus. That's about as non-religious as you get in a church. And here was my thought. I think he knows God. Why? Because he's talking to him in normal language. He didn't use King James. Pit, sweaty. <laughs> Love you, Lord. It shows me there's a relationship that is happening in that moment. That it's real. That it's authentic. That he knows God. He's not coming with his pious hat on. He's not coming with a certain robe to wear. He's talking to Jesus as though Jesus were his father. Hey, Dad, yeah. You got any Old Spice? <laughs> I think it's awesome. That's the kind of church I want to go to. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. It's real. And it's authentic. And oh, there's an odor in that. <laughs> Sorry. There's an odor in that. But there's beauty in that odor. And when you walk in religion, it stinks. And it smells. And it has an odor that is not Jesus. The word church itself, Ecclesiastes, it means the called out of God. They've been called out. And when the church was given the name, the church, it was never ever meant to be a religious term, and yet man has made it all about religion. And it stinks. And that odor is unattractive. And that odor will keep people from New Horizons. But when you get near Jesus, when you can touch Jesus, and when you see Jesus, and when you hear from Jesus, you fall in love with Jesus. Why? Because he's the authentic father. He's the authentic God. He's the real thing. The phrase, taste and see. You mean Coke? Pepsi? I'm going to go old school. Most of you won't even know this. Simba? I saw you back there. That used to be a pop, a soda. Do you remember that? No. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This word confusion, and I'll close out. A couple more of these slides. And then I'll be done. And I, 
I still got five pages of notes. We'll get there. Next slide. Do you have one with the, this one right here? Seminary students. So you know what that means? Guys like me. They're going to Bible college. They're supposed to get their degree in theology. They're supposed to get their three in Old Testament survey and New Testament survey. They need to get their degree in the epistles, in the Pauline epistles. This is why they're going. They're going to learn about the scriptures and about God. And this is what seminary students are doing. Seminary students, <laughs> I'm sorry, repent to plants. I told you repentance is needed. Not this. Not this. When Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he wasn't pointing to a palm tree. You understand that? See, I think they were at a palm tree and the coconuts fell and hit him in the head. <laughs> he did it again. He did it again. He offended him again. Seminary students repent to plants. And they confess. Seminary students repent to plants, confess and sorrow in prayer. To vegetation in the chapel. Can I tell you what? Here's good news. We eat vegetables here. We don't pray to them. <laughs> There's a potluck coming up next week. We ain't praying to them. Feel free. What? Just eat them. Just eat them. I'm going to close. I've made my point. God's made his point. Because I had five pages that weren't. We didn't get to. Confusion at a soccer game. Confusion in these slideshows. Confusion in America. Confusion in the churches. Do you need clarity? And I close with this story. About a week ago, remember I live in Napa Vine, and I was up on the farm heading this way. And this time of the year, something beautiful happens. Remember, in Appavine, there's a lot of farmland, and we're a higher elevation. And you'll get up certain mornings, or even in the evening, you'll begin to see this, and I'll look out into the pasture, and I'll see this beautiful fog that rolls in. And it's right out in the pasture, and you just feel like you can touch it. It's beautiful. And it just sits right there in all this pasture. And as I was heading to Longview, the fog can thicken, right? And when it gets real thick, if you're not an experienced driver, especially at nighttime, right? Because we're coming into the time of the year, you're going to get in your car, and when you get in that car, you're going to start driving, and fog's going to roll in. It's going to happen. Why? Fall, time of the year. I can't explain why. I went to Kelso. I can only tell you the fog is there. And when it rolls in and when it's thick and when it's really thick and you're driving down the road, especially in the back roads where I'm at in Napa Vine, where it's really, really dark because it's just a two-way road and there's these giant firs all around you and it's pitch black and there's fog. And your human tendency... Your natural inclination as a driver that's not experienced. You put your hand up on that switch up here, right? And you got low beams and high beams. And an unexperienced driver will do what? We got a lot of smart people in here. We got a lot of experienced drivers in here. They didn't take driver's ed at Oregon because I've seen them. And your natural inclination is to hit the high beams. Are you hearing me? Because in that moment, your cognition is wrong. In that moment, the emotions you're feeling to click on that light, to get it bright, to be able to see better, actually causes you to see unclear. And if you're not an experienced driver, you're going to do it. Fog's going to roll in. 
you're going to click that. And then you're going to go, uh-oh, what do I do now? Remember what they taught you in driver's ed. Go back to the low beams. Because although you may not be able to see farther out there, you'll have clarity. Do you hear me? Don't rely on your senses and your emotions. And please don't believe your heart. The gospel of Oprah. Now I could say the gospel of so many other names. But so many people follow her. And she's got her own gospel. And it's not in agreement with this gospel. I like Oprah. I care about her. She needs Jesus. For all of sin. Remember I told you, I, I include me in that. I'm the first one to say I've sinned. It's me. I sin. See, I don't get to judge you. And I don't need to judge you. Why? Because God judges you. And he judges me. And according to Romans 10, our calling as believers is to declare his word. How will they know who is they? The unsaved. How will they know unless someone preaches to them or teaches them or shares the truth with them? How will they know? So my job is not to go around and judge everyone. God's the judge. And God's word is what judges us. And his word judged Tim Carnes as a sinner. And so what did Tim Carnes do with that? I had two choices. And so do you. You can reject that or you can receive that. And I fell on my knees before the king of kings. And I said, Lord, I am a sinner. And I have sinned against you and you alone. And when I pray that kind of a prayer, and when you pray that kind of a prayer, and when you repent of that sin, everything in your life will change. Your entire earthly destiny can change. But way more important than that, your eternal destiny changes. Forever and ever and ever, you will be with Christ. And so when I tell you the story about the fog that rolls in, what am I telling you? The high beams of the world are on. And they're pointing people into all kinds of lies and deception. And if you do not have the experience of this book hidden within your heart, you will fall and you will sin against God. So what's the good news? Like David... Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I will not sin against you. And I close with the thought of what Jesus prayed. Father, and I pray this right now. Father, sanctify every person in this room. Set them apart by your word. For your word is the truth. And as your word is taught and as your word is received, and as your word is applied, Father, we will not walk in the deception of man, but we will walk in the eternal light of Jesus Christ, and that which is foggy becomes clear. And it's all done through the power of your Holy Spirit and the knowledge of the word of God. So, Lord, I pray for every person in this room and for those who will watch us online. You said in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. So this morning, God, for anyone that's here, I pray like the thief on the cross, they would just cry out to you, Lord, remember me. Remember me, Jesus. And the beauty of the words of our Savior says to each one of us in that moment today, today. Not only will Jesus remember you, but when we are ejected from this body, your word says, we will be with you in paradise forever and ever and ever. 
So for that one or for the many, Lord Jesus, who have prayed that prayer, God, let them know, as it says in John, that you may know that you have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give them eternal life. Give them hope. Give them joy and give them clarity. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Are you glad you come to church?